This MicroPython tutorial will demonstrate how to connect and drive a color OLED display using an ESP32. It will also touch on using ADC pins and FTP file transfers. Here's an SSD 1351 128x128 pixel color OLED display connected to an ESP32. I wrote a simple brick game similar to the arcade classic Arkanoid. I'm using a touch sensitive linear potentiometer connected to an ADC pin to control the paddle. I wrote the game and the display drivers completely in MicroPython. It's difficult to film OLEDs. My video doesn't do justice to this high quality display which is flicker free, very bright, and has excellent contrast. In addition, it's small, energy efficient, and can be powered with 3.3 volts. This is my fourth tutorial in my MicroPython ESP32 series. Please check out my earlier videos which demonstrate the basics, NeoPixels, sensors, MQTT, web servers, and more. My videos are fast paced, but my website contains complete notes for all my tutorials. A link will be placed in the description. This 1.5 inch SSD 1351 module uses a SPI interface, which I recommend over I2C because it's faster. The board requires five GPIO pins to communicate with the ESP32 in addition to VCC and ground. The SSD 1351 ground pin is connected to a ground on the ESP32. The VCC pin is connected to a 3.3 volt pin. The SCL pin is connected to GPIO 18 on the ESP32, which is the clock pin for the hardware vSpy bus. SDA is connected to GPIO 23, which is the MOSI pin for the same vSpy bus. RES or reset is connected to GPIO 16. DC, which toggles between data and command mode, is connected to GPIO 17. CS, which is chip select, goes to GPIO 5. There are currently two available hardware SPY hosts on the ESP32, HSPY and vSpy. vSpy, which I'm using here, allocates pin 18 for clock, pin 23 for MOSI, and pin 19 for MISO. Since the display is write only, MISO is not needed. HSPY uses 14, 13, and 12 for clock, MOSI, and MISO respectively. There are two other SPY buses, but they're currently reserved for the core system. This may change in the future. On a breadboard, I have the SSD 1351 OLED module and a Wemos Lowland 32. The ground from the SSD 1351 is connected to a ground on the ESP32. The VCC pin is connected to a 3.3 volt pin. SCL is connected to GPIO 18. SDA is connected to GPIO 23. Reset to GPIO 16. DC to GPIO 17 and CS to GPIO 5. Currently the CS pins are software controlled only in MicroPython, so you can choose any available GPIO pins. For this video I'm using a Raspberry Pi 3 running the latest version of Raspbian Stretch to communicate with the Lowland 32, which has the latest firmware build of MicroPython installed. Please watch the first video in the series to learn how to load the ESP32 firmware and install our shell. At the time of filming this video, the only MicroPython SSD1351 driver I could find was by Adafruit. Unfortunately, it had very limited functionality and slow performance. Therefore, I wrote my own open source library, which is available on my GitHub site. SSD1351Pi is the main OLED library. I've included several examples that demonstrate how to use the library. The breakout game I showed earlier is also included, along with several fonts, images, game levels, and utilities. I'll scroll up and copy the git clone address to the clipboard. Then switch to a terminal window and type git clone and paste in the address from the clipboard. This copies all the files from my GitHub repo to the Raspberry Pi. LS shows the downloaded MicroPython SSD1351 folder. CD into the new folder. LS again shows the library contains several files and folders. In my last video I used rshell's rsync command to copy multiple files to an ESP32. A couple of viewers complained that rshell is really slow for copying, which is true. Therefore in this video I'll use FTP, which is much faster. There's an excellent lightweight MicroPython FTP server created by Robert HH. The library FTP Pi is compatible with the ESP32. Again, I'll copy the git clone address to the clipboard. Switch back to the terminal, cd back to my home directory, clear, and type git clone, and paste in the address from the clipboard. ls shows the downloaded ESP8266 FTP server folder. Despite the name, it does work with the ESP32. cd into the downloaded folder. ls shows the files. The FTP file needs to be copied to the ESP32, so I'll run our shell. ls slash pyboard shows the contents of the ESP32. I've already uploaded the main.py file from my last video, which automatically runs at boot and connects to my Wi-Fi. Network access is required for FTP communications. cpftp.py slash pyboard copies the FTP file to the ESP32. If you're on a Windows or Mac computer, you could also use Adafruit's AMPI utility 
to transfer the FTP file. ls slash pyboard shows the FTP file in the root folder of the ESP32. Type REPL to enter the REPL. Again, if you're on Windows, you can use PuTTY, and on a Mac, you can use the built-in screen program to access the REPL. Import FTP starts the FTP server on the ESP32 at IP address 192.168.192.10. We can now connect to the FTP server with any FTP client and start transferring files. On the Pi in a new terminal, type sudo apt-get install FTP. This installs a very basic Linux command line FTP client. Type FTP followed by the ESP32's IP address. Currently authentication is not supported, so just press enter. We're now logged in. On the left side of the screen, the FTP server acknowledges the connection. ls lists the file contents of the ESP32, boot.py, ftp.py, and main.py. Exclamation point ls lists the file contents of the current folder on the Raspberry Pi, which is the home directory. LCD, which stands for Local Change Directory, is used to switch into the MicroPython SSD1351 folder. Exclamation point ls shows the contents of the library. Input star period pi is used to copy all the Python files to the ESP32. OK, I don't want a confirmation prompt for each file, so I'll cancel the copy with Control c Type prompt to toggle the confirmation prompts off. Input star period pi again, and this time it's silent. The files are copying. The video is not sped up. The FTP server does a great job of quickly transferring the files. ls shows all the copied Python files on the ESP32. Exclamation point ls shows that there are still three folders that need to be copied. Fonts, images, and levels. Unfortunately, this simple FTP client isn't very efficient for copying folders, so let's try a more advanced client. Typing by closes the FTP connection and also causes the ESP32 to terminate the FTP server. Since the FTP server has already been imported, it can be restarted by typing ftp.ftp server. The FTP server is back up on the same IP address. On the Pi in a blank terminal, type sudo apt get install FileZilla. FileZilla is a free full-featured graphical FTP client which runs on Linux, Mac, and Windows. After installation from the Raspberry Pi main menu, click Internet, FileZilla. Then click File, Site Manager, New Site. I'll call it ESP32. For host, type the FTP server IP address. Next, switch to the Transfer Settings tab and click Passive Transfer Mode and check the box to limit the number of connections to one. Click Connect, which connects to the server very quickly. The contents of the ESP32 are displayed in the right pane. On the left pane are the file contents of the Raspberry Pi home folder. Scroll down and widen the file name column. Double click MicroPython SSD1351 to switch to that folder. Control click is used to highlight the fonts, images, and levels folders. Right click and select Upload to transfer the three folders and their contents to the ESP32. The lower pane shows the upload status. 36 files in the three folders are being copied. In addition to the improved speed, FTP is supported by many of the popular code editors such as Atom, Sublime, and VS Code. This allows you to write code in your favorite editor and have the files automatically uploaded to the ESP32. The three uploaded folders are now on the ESP32 and the software is ready to go. Back in the REPL type import OS. Then os.lister can be used to list the directory contents using Python. There are several demos that you can use to help get started. OK, now let's take a look at drawing to the display. We'll start with the included shapes demo. From SSD1351, display and color565 are imported. From machine, pin and spy are imported. Spy is instantiated on bus number 2, which is vSpy. The baud rate is set to 14.5 million. You can go higher, but you may get some noticeable artifacts on the screen. It's necessary to specify the clock and MOSI pins. An SSD1351 display is instantiated and passed the SPI along with the pins for DC, CS, and reset. The display is now ready to take drawing commands. I've documented my OLED library thoroughly in addition to providing several demos. The library has support for most common geometric primitives such as circles, ellipses, lines, points, polygons, and rectangles. Draws for an outline shape and fills for a solid object. We'll run the shapes demo by typing import demo shapes. A blue screen is drawn using the clear command with the optional color parameter. The screen is cleared and a few lines and a rectangle are drawn in different colors. Draw lines can take a list of coordinates to create any 2D shape. Fill polygon creates a solid heptagon. Some more rectangles. A triangle, again using draw polygon. A couple of circles and ellipses. Cleanup turns off the display and clears the spy resources. 
My library supports up to 65,535 different colors, which is referred to as RGB565 color space. Let's take a look at the color palette demo. The HSV to RGB method from my previous video helps smoothly cycle through the colors. XY4 loops span the display's width and height to create an 8x8 grid. The spectrum is divided into 64 colors. The color 565 method takes the RGB values returned from the HSV to RGB function and generates the corresponding 16-bit color. Fill circle draws a solid radius 7 circle using the specified color. The loop repeats and the grid is filled. Next there's an animation example called Demo Bouncing Boxes. This demo uses the MicroPython Random and Utime libraries. There's a box class. Upon initialization the random numbers are seeded and the boxes assign non-zero random XY speeds between negative 5 and 5. Seeding the random number generated using the method tickCPU ensures different random numbers each time the program started. There's a method to update the position and speed. Another method handles drawing boxes. There are six different colored boxes, six different sizes. A list holds the six boxes. At the start of an infinite while loop, tickUS stores the current milliseconds. A for loop cycles through the boxes, updates their position, and draws them. At the end of the loop, tickSdiff is used to calculate the duration and then SleepUS attempts to adjust the loop to 30 frames per second, which is a good speed for animation. Sprites and images can be loaded from the ESP32 flash storage. They need to be formatted in RGB565 raw format. I created a Python command line utility called img to RGB565 and added it to my repo's utils folder. It can convert most of the common image types such as JPEG and PNG to the required format. The demo sprite program is similar to the bouncing boxes demo, but instead of rectangles, it animates a sprite. Drawing an object using points, lines, and shapes is relatively slow. A sprite is a stored image that can be displayed much faster, which is necessary for animating more complex graphics. The load sprite method loads an RGB565 raw image of a MicroPython logo. As before, there's an update position and a draw method. The draw sprite method draws the sprite, x, y are the top left coordinates, W and H are the width and height. Sprites are great for animation, but for fixed graphics, images are more efficient. The demo images program uses the draw image method to load image files in RGB565 raw format from the ESP32 flash drive and draw them directly to the OLED display. Unlike sprites, you don't need a buffer variable to store the images, which saves memory. Again, forgive my photography because the images really do look great in person. Flicker free, dark blacks, and good color contrast. With my SSD1351 library, I've included a module with support for XGLCD fonts in both portrait and landscape mode. You can convert any TrueType font to XGLCD format using a free utility called GLCD Font Creator. There's instructions for the conversion process on my website. The demo fonts program first imports the XGLCD font library. Next, nine different fonts are instantiated. Arcade Pix, Valley, Broadway, Espresso Dolce, Fixed Font, Neato, Robotron, Unispace, and Wendy. I've included these nine fonts in my repo. Draw text is used to draw text in the different fonts with different colors. Draw text also accepts an optional landscape parameter to allow drawing text in landscape mode as opposed to portrait, which is the default. In landscape mode, the XY coordinates still refer to the character's top left. Draw text can also accept a background color parameter, so you can set the text background color in addition to the actual text color. Not shown is an optional spacing parameter to change the letter spacing. There's also a measure text method, which can be used to help position your text. I'll put some sample code on my website. Now let's take a look at the game. Arcade games like Arkanoid use the spinner to control the paddle. I didn't have any extra spinners, so I'm using a Spectra Symbol Linear 10K Ohm Soft Pot. It functions similarly to a standard potentiometer. Pressing down along the pad changes the resistance. If you don't have a soft pot, you can substitute any regular potentiometer. It could be hooked up exactly the same. One of the pot's terminals is connected to ground. The other is connected to 3.3 volts in series with a 6200 ohm resistor. By default, the ESP32 ADC pins can only read up to around 1 volt. I use the ADC attend method to set the attenuation to 6 dB, which increases the range to about 2 volts. A potentiometer is a variable voltage divider when its terminal ends are connected to a power supply. Moving the wiper varies the voltage on the middle pin. Without the 6200 ohm resistor, this would be 0 to 3.3 volts. Since the ADC can only read 2 volts, this would lose over a third of the pot's range. 
The resistor offsets the pot's range from zero to about two volts. This takes advantage of the pot's full range. The wiper is connected to GPIO 36, which is labeled VP. An optional resistor is placed in series. A 6.8 PF cap is placed between the wiper and ground to help smooth out some of the noise. The ESP3280C is not very good. It's very noisy, and there are issues with linearity. I plotted the ADC values between 0 and 2 volts. The green indicates the ideal line, the orange is the actual values. There's a significant distortion towards both ends, however most of the path is relatively straight. It's linear enough for a game paddle. There's just a little roughness when the paddle is close to the walls. If you were trying to read a sensor, you could use a polynomial equation to smooth out the readings. To improve accuracy, you could also increase the VCC terminal resistor and add one to the ground terminal. This could crop the voltage to the linear portion of the chart. Back on the breadboard, a resistor is connected to a 3.3 volt pin on the ESP32. The other end is patched to one of the terminals on the soft pot. I'm using a 4700 ohm resistor instead of a 6200 because it was the closest I could find in my parts bin. This puts the output around 0 to 2.25 volts, which only sacrifices a little bit of range. An optional 1000 ohm resistor is connected to GPIO 36. The other end is patched to the soft pot's wiper. The other terminal on the soft pot is connected to the breadboard's ground rail. Then the ground rail is connected to a ground on the ESP32. Let's see how the ADC is working so far. As mentioned earlier, the ESP32 ADC is very noisy, which can lead to erratic readings. Currently the game paddle is tracking terribly. This could be mitigated with a little math and some sampling, but a quick fix is just to add a 6.8 PF capacitor between the ADC pin and ground. Now that's more like it. The paddle is now tracking my finger very smoothly. It's good enough for gameplay. If you need more precision, I made an earlier Raspberry Pi video on external ADC chips such as the MCP3002 and the ADS1115. I'll put a link in the description. Here's the code to read the soft pot. From machine, import ADC and pin. An ADC is instantiated on GPL36. Afterwards, the attend method is set to 6 dB, which increases the default 0 to 1 volt range to 0 to 2 volts. The ADC read method can then be used to read the pot's position. The analog voltage is translated to a 12-bit value between 0 and 4095, where 0 equals 0 volts and 4095 equals 2 volts. The results are divided by 44 and incremented by 5 to match the game paddle's x-axis range of 6 to 98 pixels. I created 9 levels for the game. The binary level files are comprised of 3 bytes, x, y, and color. I placed the code I used to generate them in the repo's utils folder in case anyone wants to add more levels. I hope you found this video helpful. You can support this channel by leaving a like, sharing, and subscribing. I really appreciate all the positive comments and thanks for watching.